Mustang Sally. Mm. Mm. Won't you slow your Mustang down? Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Zing! Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Dean Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. And I what brought on Mustang Sally? I don't know. I think it's Voodoo Charlie that brought on Mustang Sally. There's something similar about him. I don't know if it, that's it, but uh, something about that name is making me think of that. Okay. Or something else. It's like tickling at my brain. You're getting ahead of yourself, sir. I am. Uh, welcome, everybody. I already said my name, didn't I? And you said yours? I did. Okay, well, then we're done. See you later. Good night, folks. <laughs> and I am an outer man. Oh, welcome. Yes, thanks for joining us again, sir. Yeah, so today we have a, a unusual event, a special episode of sorts. You want to tell the lovely listeners at home what's going on? I guess this is a special episode in that it's something we've not done before, is it? I don't think so. We're going to present a story that is just me reading it. And that I don't think we've ever done, unless it was Van Leeuwen Hook and even that one. Even, I yeah, I, I still said, dive, dive in that one. I think that was my one line. but It's just me reading it uh, as part of an audiobook that is available to buy on Audible. Dot com. And uh, the author is Stephen E. Waddell, and he's got a short story collection of five stories that are all set on Halloween. Of course, you know, we're putting this out in June of 2013 instead of Halloween. Why? Because we can. Because we can. Nice one. And uh, shortly, probably sometime around the time this episode comes out, You can go to Audible and buy that short story collection if you'd like. The collection is called Unholy Womb, and this story is called Unholy Womb. Okay. But this is the title track off of the album. And uh, (laughs) anyhow, it's a fairly short story of just a story. Straight reading? Is that what you call what I did? I don't know if anything you read can be called a straight reading, sir. That is good. Was it, though? And so <laughs> so the story is exactly as it will appear in the collection. And shoot, we don't have like an about the author or any of that stuff. Yeah, this will be the... Since it's exactly as it appears in the collection, it'll be different. This is a special episode, after all, so it's it's different in that way. About the author... Stephen E. Waddell grew up in Enid, Oklahoma, and began writing in elementary school. He sold his first story to the Midnight Zoo magazine in 1992, and has currently five novels in print, including the popular werewolf saga books, published by Scribe Press. If he looks in a man's eyes, he knows that man's darkest secrets. If he looks in a woman's eyes... He knows only his own. Anyhow, uh, yesterday, the day before I'm recording this, I got an email from Stephen, from the author, and he, he said, you know, that he uh, he liked the performance and he was sending it through. And I asked him, because you had suggested this, if I could do one of the stories, if we could do one of the stories on the show, and he said, go right ahead. And so here we are the next day doing it. <laughs> Um, and this will probably be the shortest turnaround time for an episode ever, right? Ever, ever. Except yeah. for the fact that I recorded it in, what, February? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I guess there's that. So, anyhow, Unholy Womb by Stephen E. Waddell. Unholy Womb The horror began on a day Danny believed to be a perfect prelude to autumn. Autumn was his favorite season. The air was charged with electricity, harvest smells filled the breezes and gave the first winter goose pimples. But most of all, the season led to the day, Halloween. It was because of the coming holiday that Danny was walking along the sidewalk of Ash Street in his little town of Windfall, Illinois. A breeze sent leaves scurrying around his feet with a sound like old bones knocking together. 
Danny was going to get a pumpkin for his Halloween jack-o'-lantern. For as long as he could remember, he had been getting pumpkins from Farmer Sutton. Of all the farmers who grew pumpkins around Windfall, Farmer Sutton was Danny's favorite. They had an agreement through an old friendship between the farmer and Danny's father. Danny got the privilege of going through the entire pumpkin patch before the majority was trucked off to the market and the rest picked over by the townspeople that came to Sutton's farm for their jack-o'-lanterns. Danny didn't think he would have any trouble securing two pumpkins from his friend this year. The sidewalk he was traveling on showed cracks and was crumbling in places as he neared the edge of town. The walk soon petered out completely, and Ash Street changed from a paved avenue to a dirt road. Danny kept walking. He had forgotten about the run-down little shack he had to pass on his way out of town, until he looked up and saw the ramshackle building where Voodoo Charlie lived. He hurried to the other side of the road. The dwelling was gray from lack of paint, and only about as large as Danny's father's tool shed. Bowed two-by-fours held a sagging roof over a packed dirt porch. The shingles remaining on the building were of rotted pine, a rusty stovepipe pointed crookedly at the sky. As he crept past, a little white dog left his place in front of the door and ran under the fence and across the road to bark at Danny's heels. Danny knew from previous journeys that the dog wouldn't bite him, so his only worry was that the noise the little cur made would bring his owner from the shack. But Voodoo Charlie didn't come out of the house. Danny made two more turns, and then the Sutton's farm came into view. Acres of gold, with small splotches of just-ripening pumpkins under the waving corn stalks. A quarter of a mile up the dirt road was the driveway that led to the pale green farmhouse. Coming from the direction of the drive, and less than half that distance away, was a shuffling scarecrow. Danny's heart increased its pace as he realized he would have to confront Voodoo Charlie after all. For the second time, Danny crossed the road to be as far away as possible from the old man. As Danny crossed the road, Voodoo Charlie stopped walking. He stood on his side of the dirt lane and watched the boy advance. The closer Danny came to the waiting figure, the more features he recognized. The stained tan pants, the yellow shirt with black buttons and a limp collar, the dusty brown shoes, the dark withered skin of the hands and wrists. Voodoo Charlie's short gray hair curled close to his scalp. There were bags under his eyes, and deep lines marked his chocolate-brown face like cracks on a dirty egg. As Danny passed, he could see the few remaining teeth in Voodoo Charlie's mouth, rotted black and yellow. A pink tongue licked the gaping, crooked holes. "'Goin' to get your hiring, pumpkin?' Voodoo Charlie asked in his cracked voice. Danny tried to answer, but only managed to croak a positive response. He didn't stop walking. "'Get a biggin'. The ancient black man said as Danny passed. Danny upped his brisk pace until he turned onto the dirt driveway leading to the little farmhouse. Heck, the Sutton's golden retriever, greeted him halfway up the drive. Mrs. Sutton appeared on the porch of the house, and a smile spread over her plump farmwife face. Hi, Miss Sutton, Danny said, hopping onto the porch beside the woman. Hello, Danny, she answered. Come on in. I just took an apple pie out of the oven a little while ago. I don't think Jean's ate it all yet. She turned to leave him into the house. The dog followed behind Danny, tail wagging as if he too wanted a piece of pie. No, heck, you can't come in. Go on. Mrs. Sutton shooed the dog off the porch. He began to chase one of the chickens that had wandered to the front of the house. Mrs. Sutton shook her head at the dog's antics. Spoiled rotten, she whispered to Danny. Inside the kitchen, they found Farmer Sutton sitting at the table eating a piece of steaming pie. He had obviously just come in from the fields. Dust coated his faded bib overalls and red flannel shirt, the sleeves of which were rolled up past his elbows. His blue eyes lit up, and his whiskery face split into a grin when he saw Danny. "'Hey there, boy!' he boomed. "'The old lady there was just telling me today that you'd probably be over soon. For once she was right,' he winked at Danny. Mrs. Sutton, who'd gone to a cupboard to get a plate for Danny's pie, turned at the remark. She, too, was smiling. Watch what you say, old man. I just might take a rolling pin to your head. Danny noticed the huge pumpkin on the countertop near the sink. It was two pumpkins, actually. Siamese twins grown together to form one vegetable. They'd grown together at an angle, so that when one sat directly upright, the other was tilted. 
The odd gourd was still green on much of its surface. Do you like it? Farmer Sutton asked. Danny nodded, his mouth full of pie. We thought we'd carve two faces in it, like on truth or consequences. One happy, one sad. What do you think? That'll look good, Danny replied, thinking it would be a good time to make his request for an extra pumpkin. Mrs. Sutton spoke before he could. I guess I'll go out and finish hanging up the laundry now that Jean got rid of that nutty black man. Danny tried hard to swallow a mouthful of pie, but by the time he got it down, Mrs. Sutton had already gone out the back door. Voodoo Charlie was here? he asked the farmer. Yes, he was here. Again, I should say. Jean Sutton shook his head. I don't know what it is about that old man. We haven't bothered him, but he's been hanging around a lot lately. I've lost count of the times I've caught him in the fields. He started coming around just after I fertilized last winter. Then he stopped until I started planting. Since then, he's been coming around every few weeks. I'll see him just meandering through the fields. It's not just here, either. All the other farmers I've talked to have told me he's been around their farms, too. He paused in his speech, then snorted. I said we hadn't bothered him. That's true, but not completely. When I was a boy about your age, I bothered him plenty. Me and every other boy in town. Most of the girls, too. Do the kids still tease him? Some, Danny said. He doesn't come into town much. He paused, ate another bite of pie, then asked, How old do you think he is? I don't know. He looked exactly the same when I was a kid, and that was, well, a while back. Why does everyone call him Voodoo Charlie? Because he's so weird, I guess. But there used to be stories about him stealing dead babies from their graves to use in his evil potions. Farmer Sutton smiled, but immediately the man's laughter died, and his face took on a troubled look. The past four or five years had seen a rash of grave robbing in the area, all the victims being infants. The crimes had stopped just shortly before the previous winter. I better get back to work, Farmer Sutton said. When you've finished there, you can just help yourself to the pumpkins. I'm sure you'll find one you like. He got up from his chair and turned toward the back door. His hand was turning the knob before Danny found the courage to speak. Mr. Sutton? The farmer turned back to face him. Would you mind if I took two pumpkins this year? There's this girl, and she asked me to carve one for her. Danny rushed the last words. The farmer grinned broadly, winked, and said, Sure, you take as many as you need. Danny wolfed down the last few bites of apple pie and hurried to the pumpkin fields. It took him nearly two hours to find two pumpkins that would suit the faces he was planning to put on them. He carried them to the house and put them on the back porch. For the first time, he wondered how he would get them all the way home. Mrs. Sutton provided the answer. Think you can get them home in this? She brought a rusty red wagon with squeaky wheels from the barn. Yes, thanks, Danny said, relieved to see the squeaking relic. He put the pumpkins in and took up the handle. Well, thanks for the pumpkins. I'd better get home. The sun was already nearing the horizon, and his shadow was long and dark. The air had taken on a nippy coolness. Okay, Danny, have a nice Halloween. I will. You too. Mrs. Sutton waited until Danny was nearly out of earshot before calling. I hope your little girlfriend likes her pumpkin, too. Blushing from neck to hair, Danny only waved and hurried on up the drive. He could hear the woman laughing as she went inside the house. Back on the road, he forced the blush off his face and concentrated on hurrying home. He crossed to the other side of the road long before he reached Voodoo Charlie's shack. He hoped with every ounce of his being that he would not see the old black man. He willed the wheels of the wagon to be silent while he passed. As soon as the ramshackle dwelling came into view, Danny saw the man in a rocking chair on the front porch. Voodoo Charlie rocked steadily and looked in the direction Danny came from, as if waiting on the boy. The squeaking wheels brought the dog from his place at the old man's feet. He slipped under the fence and ran up the road, barking. The dog began his usual pouncing and nipping at Danny's heels. Danny saw the smile on Voodoo Charlie's face as he grew closer. When Danny began to pass the house, the rocking chair ceased its motion. Got your two of them, huh? Voodoo Charlie asked. 
Yes. Danny never slowed his pace. Good. The ancient black man grinned his rotted grin. You're all good, Allery. You and all the other kiddies. I know that I sure will. <laughs> Trick or treat! <laughs> he crowed, his voice cracking as he laughed hysterically. He slapped his skinny knees and rocked madly. The rest of the journey home passed without problems. Danny took the vegetables to his room on the second floor and put them on his window sill to finish ripening. Two weeks later, on a Saturday, Danny's parents went to the grocery store for the week's shopping, leaving Danny home alone. The pumpkins were ripe enough for carving. Danny took a short butcher knife and went upstairs to cut out the hideous faces he had stored in his imagination. He discovered Voodoo Charlie's trick almost too late. Halfway across his room, he detected movement from the direction of his window. He stopped and looked. His eyes widened as he saw a figure standing among the broken shards of one of the pumpkins. The beast was just over eight inches tall and dull orange in color, like the rind of the pumpkin it had hatched from. It crouched on bowed legs, its pot belly tightening and relaxing as it breathed. Leathery wings tipped with small black horns rippled on its back. The hands and feet of the creature all ended in long, curved nails. Danny could see tiny muscles bulging on the small arms and legs. The orange head was about the size of a ping-pong ball. Thick lips curled away from lethal yellow fangs. Pointed ears swept back from the side of the head. They twitched as the thing studied Danny. Two more black horns, slightly longer than those on the wings, protruded from the forehead in direct line with the bulbous tan-colored eyes. The bat goblin let out a squeaky battle cry and hopped from the window sill, its wings flapping. It came soaring through the room toward Danny's throat. Danny did the only thing he could think of. He swung the knife as the creature drew close, stepping out of the way at the same time. The knife missed completely, but the step back kept the thing from getting his throat. The needle-sharp teeth sank into his arm instead. Danny gasped in pain. The knife flew from his fingers. He tried to tear the monster off his arm by pulling on it just below the wings, but the teeth had a firm hold. The creature clawed at his flesh, leaving bloody scratches. Danny released the thing's torso and tugged sharply on one of the legs. The limb tore away from the body with a sound like raw meat on styrofoam. Yellow goo trailed from the ragged end. The creature's pot belly swelled with blood. Danny dropped the leg and went into a frenzy. He grabbed at the beast, pulling off the remaining limbs, the wings, and bits of the torso in gory handfuls that he dropped to the floor. Soon all that was left on his arm was the small horned head, still sucking. Danny could feel the blood being drawn from his arm and watched as it drained out the ragged stump of the monster's throat. Danny took the monster's head in his hand, squeezing while he pulled upward in a way until it was dislodged from his arm. The fangs tore away small ribbons of flesh, and the jaw began to snap loudly as it tried to get the teeth into Danny's fingers. Danny dropped the head to the floor. The teeth continued to click together. He stomped on it with his sneakered foot. It made a sound like a chicken bone breaking. More yellow fluid oozed onto the carpet, mingling with the blood dripping from Danny's fingers. Voodoo Charlie did it. Voodoo Charlie did it. Danny rubbed his eyes, trying to clear his head. He could smell blood drying on his arm. He let his hands drop to his sides, and his eyes found the window and the pumpkin that had not yet hatched. Danny stepped carefully over the pieces of his vanquished enemy and looked for the butcher knife. He found it on the floor beside his bed. He took the knife to the window, gripping it tightly. He examined the pieces of the broken womb first, poking at them with the point of the knife before touching them with his fingers. The shards were dry and brittle, cracking and breaking into several more pieces at his touch. Danny noticed that there was none of the stringy pulp or small seeds that were supposed to be inside a pumpkin. He scraped the pieces to the floor and examined the other vegetable. The orange skin still had several lighter patches on its rough surface. Cracks made dark veins on places where the pumpkin was completely ripe. Danny slid the point of the knife into the top of the orange globe, a few inches from the stem, and cut a circle. When the cut was complete, he withdrew his blade and lifted the top of the pumpkin. The green stem continued on the inside of the vegetable, glistening moistly, unlike the dried stub on the outside. It coiled round and round to the small orange body, lying in a fetal position on its back at the bottom of the pumpkin. The unborn monster was surrounded in a thin covering of orange pulp 
speckled with shriveled tan seeds. The green umbilical cord went through the pulp and between the creature's knees to attach to its stomach. The monster itself was not yet fully developed, but like the pumpkin's ripeness, its time was very close. The eyes were oversized, pus-filled bubbles, as were the tips of the fingers and toes where the claws would soon break through. The horns on its head were not yet as long as the previous creature's, and looked much more delicate. The horns on the wingtips were the same. The thing did not move as Danny peered into the womb. Danny wondered for a moment about what to do with the monster, before he decided on the obvious conclusion. He pushed the point of his knife through the pulp and into the chest of the beast. Voodoo Charlie's creation did not even twitch as the knife sank home. The odor released from the body when the demon was aborted caused Danny to gag. He gave the knife a sharp jab, felt it pin the monster to the bottom of its womb, and then staggered back, the smell making him think of the dead baby jokes he had heard in school. What about the other pumpkins? Danny thought about the hundreds Farmer Sutton had grown, the thousands the other farmers around Windfall had raised and sent to market. Danny remembered Farmer Sutton telling him that the old Negro had been to all the farms around the town. Would people all over the country be getting a nasty trick, courtesy of Voodoo Charlie this Halloween? What about the unusual pumpkin that had been sitting on the Sutton's kitchen counter? Danny left the house at a run, not bothering to wash the blood from his arm, or even to leave his parents a note explaining where he had gone. A cold wind blew in his face as he ran along the sidewalk of Ash Street. He pounded hundreds of multicolored leaves beneath his feet, dodging an elderly man raking his front lawn and nearly colliding with a little girl on a tricycle. Soon the town dropped behind him. An extra burst of speed carried him past Voodoo Charlie's shack before the little white dog could even get under the fence to nip at his heels. Danny turned the corner onto the road where Farmer Sutton lived, and the little farmhouse sprang into view. Danny's run became a dead stop, and then a hurried but nervous walk when he saw the bent form of the ancient black man standing at the head of the Sutton's driveway. Voodoo Charlie was watching the house. He seemed to be waiting on something. Does he want to hear the screams of the farmer and his wife when their pumpkin hatches? Screams, Danny thought, that might be symbolic of the screams heard all over the nation. Danny forced himself to take the steps that brought him closer to the bent form of Voodoo Charlie. He must have heard Danny's labored breathing, and nervous steps approaching on the road. Voodoo Charlie turned to face him, and for a moment Danny felt sure the old man could taste his fear. The pink tongue licked the cracked lips through a hole where the teeth were missing. Voodoo Charlie smiled at him, and Danny looked away. You're just in time, boy, Voodoo Charlie said. I think your farmer friend is about to have himself a set of twins. <laughs> The old man began to cackle. Danny sidled quickly past him and hurried up the drive. When the screams began, Danny started running toward the house. Behind him, Voodoo Charlie laughed harder. Danny stepped onto the front lawn as Mrs. Sutton ran out of the house, her skirt flying around her knees. The screen door banged against the side of the house and then slammed closed. Heck bounded from the other side of the porch. Mrs. Sutton was screaming and waving her pudgy arms frantically. One of the orange pumpkin monsters hung from her neck, its body swelling as it drained the blood from the woman. Heck saw the creature hanging from his mistress's neck and tried to jump high enough to tear it away, but Mrs. Sutton's movements prevented him from getting a hold on it. Over the woman's screams and the dog's barking, Danny could still hear Voodoo Charlie cackling. The monster burst. Danny was still several feet from the struggling group but he was near enough to see the bloated body of the creature explode, and close enough to be sprayed by the flying goo. He wiped his face and hurried to where Mrs. Sutton had slumped to the ground. Only the small orange head remained, still clinging to the woman's neck by its teeth, blood pumping from its throat. Heck was nosing at the head. Danny pushed the dog away and bent over Mrs. Sutton. He carefully pried the sucking head from her neck but even as it came free, he felt the strained pulse in the farm wife's throat flutter and die. Danny stomped the head to mush under his foot while tears leaked from his eyes. He hurried to the house, already sure what he would find. From the living room, he could see the body of Farmer Sutton sprawled over the kitchen table, the broken pieces of the Siamese twin pumpkin scattered around him. The remains of his killer were splattered around the room, yellow specks, like mucus, clung to the walls and appliances. 
The head continued pumping a thin trickle of blood from the back of the farmer's neck onto the table, where it ran off and fell to the pool spreading across the linoleum floor. Danny silently left the house. It was quiet outside. The cold wind made the only sound. The golden retriever joined Danny on the porch of his farmhouse. Danny absently patted the dog's head, and then went slowly down the steps, avoiding the corpse lying a few feet away, and started back up the drive. The dog followed him a short way, then turned and went back. Danny let him go. Voodoo Charlie was nowhere in sight. What about the pumpkins? How long before reports start coming in of people attacked by little orange creatures that hatch from their Halloween jack-o'-lanterns? What about Voodoo Charlie? Will he be caught and punished? At the edge of the driveway, Danny found a crumpled heap of clothing, a yellow shirt with black buttons, a pair of almost worn-out tan pants, and two dusty brown shoes. All that was left of Voodoo Charlie. Almost. A gust of October wind rocked Danny on his feet. As it blew past, he heard the dry, cackling laughter of the old black man. And the hoarse words, Happy Halloween! <laughs> the end. All right, everybody. Did you enjoy the story? Happy Halloween to you all. <laughs> See, I, I subscribe to the ministry idea that every day is Halloween. Okay. That the yeah. Ministry of Silly Walks? Uh, no, it's a different ministry. Oh, oh the, okay. The ministry. Oh, just the ministry? So anyhow, what did you think, first off? Uh, it was a good story. I enjoyed it. You want, okay. want me to expand beyond that? I was uh, Announcer man, do you have anything to say about it? No. All right, well, once again, it's going to be another episode <laughs> I talk through. <laughs> That's all of them. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed the story. Interesting idea. The uh, pumpkin as womb for unholiness. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Well, it's, it certainly had an unhappy ending. Yeah, it did. I think it had a lot of potential, and... It's it's one of those stories we kind of talk about a lot where it leaves you wanting more. It ends at the point where you want to begin. He talks uh, several times about there's hundreds or thousands of pumpkins out there waiting to hatch more creatures in his town, across, across the, the country, yeah. and so forth. And we don't get to hear about any of that. I was actually kind of surprised, you know, when, when the farmer and his wife died. And then I went and I looked to see how much time was left in the story as I was listening to your reading. And it was almost over. And I thought, oh, I guess we won't hear about the rest of it. But uh, I guess it leaves the possibility of many sequels to this story if you wanted to. Unholy Womb 2, colon Unholier Womb. <laughs> the, wow. So the length of the story... One. You feel like it was exactly the length that it was supposed to be, or would you have enjoyed it three times longer? I think it could have been longer, definitely. I don't know if I would have enjoyed it three times longer. I guess it depends on what he had for us. Well, I mean, it's just the tip of the iceberg, as you said. There could be, you know, unbelievable destruction, and there could also be backstory into why. what, Why the revenge? What was his ultimate goal, and how did he achieve it? Yeah, it seems like there should be a Gremlins-type movie that follows the end of this story where, you know, these pumpkins are all over town and the, the mean old lady gets attacked by a bunch of them and uh, they take over the bar and make poor old Phoebe Cates have to serve them, you know, a bunch of beer and then and they dress up and put on glasses and things like that and all sorts of hilariousness should be in store for us until Spike finally, you know, gets them back on track. Stripe. Oh, was it Stripe? Anyways, it does seem like that kind of stuff should be in store. I don't know. I was kind of slightly disappointed at the timing of the boy's arrival at the farmer's house. He was just a minute too late. Yeah, it was too late for anything. You know what I mean? I think it would have had more tension, more dra drama. More drama. If uh, 
you know, he got there a minute too early and had to fight and then perhaps did not succeed. Well, if we were expanding this for a movie, he would have already given his first love girl that pumpkin that was intended for her. So I, it, I think it would still be, it would be fine that the farmer and his wife died because now he's just like, oh crap, he has to get over there before his girlfriend's hatches. And that way, you know, he could arrive in time. You could still have him have the heroic save there. I, I don't know. It, for me, this feels like a Twilight Zone episode, a 30 minute story, but it's not enough for a feature length movie. You'd have to expand it. But as the story goes, I think you could adapt it perfectly in a 22, 23 minute TV version. Uh huh. I, I, there aren't any shows like that anymore, are there? Anthology shows like that? Uh, they seem to like come and go every now and then, but they, they come and go really quick. You know, like everybody's, oh, we're going to do a new Outer Limits and Outer Limits comes and then it has a, half a season or whatever and then disappears again. And then they decide to do an Alfred Hitchcock Presents again and et cetera, et cetera. Like all the shows, they try and resurrect them. But yeah, they don't, they don't seem to last very long. It seems like people's taste for horror has a gone beyond what you can show on a regular tv station and perhaps b gone beyond what you can do in a half hour i don't know there needs to be lots of gore and death traps that uh, you have to saw your own arm off to uh, be able to get out alive see i think that era is over too i think now we're into the stupid somebody sets up their camcorder and this is what they catch and you can watch it. Or somebody is videotaping something and you can watch them record it on their iPhone, you know, but, uh, well, there's and, that and whatever is the next thing. I mean, <laughs> I see, I've always loved the anthology format uh -huh. and having a new group of characters. I mean, you can kill them all if you want to in your 30 minute ending of the story, or, I mean, you can have the horrible, unhappy ending in a, you know, a weekly show yeah, when you're true. not expected to bring them all back, continue the narrative next week. Yeah. When it's a half hour thing like that too, that, you know, people don't get so invested that they expect you to save the person at the end. Like they do when you get into something much longer, you know, you need somebody to come out. Okay. At the end. Uh, usually, I mean, there are movies that don't do that, but more often than not, there's uh Someone that comes out victorious. A, a lot of times with a horror movie, though, they come out victorious and then the last thing gets them. When you think they're, they're finally done, then Jason jumps up out of the water or Cabin in the Woods is not really a good example. But then the Elder God or whatever comes up out of the ground and destroys the two people that managed to survive and I guess goes on to destroy the world or whatever. But yeah, I mean, you, you can do that in a, in a horror movie, which can't do in most movies because people just freak out when there's an unhappy ending to a normal film. But even in horror movies, it's less, you know, likely to have the, you know, somebody has to get out okay. Lots and lots of people don't, don't make it, but usually there's that one virgin or whatever who makes it to the end. Yeah, and, and I don't know if audiences truly prefer that. Or if that's just the formula and it's so easy to copy the formula. I don't, I don't know. But I love the everything is all right. Oh, no, it isn't. Credits <laughs> ending. I love that. And yeah, you've certainly seen me write that in my stories. It has, it's harder in text than it is in the movie. To do just the jump scare in that, those are so easy. <laughs> Something is in the mirror or whatever. It's so easy to do in a movie. You know what I mean? A cat jumps out or whatever. How do you do a cat jump out scare in a story? Yeah, it just doesn't work like that. You have to. Well, there are fewer cheats, I think, in a story. I, you know, I really enjoyed this story. Let me give you a tiny bit of backstory on this. I've been doing these audiobook things for Audible, ostensibly for Audible. They're not all out there yet since January. And I, I know I've talked about it, but not on the actual show as far as I know. But they do it very much like a, an acting gig where they hold auditions. And if you want to uh, audition for something, there's usually a sample of a story or book that they want you to perform. And this one was unusual because for the audition, he wanted you to read the whole story. So what you just heard was my audition to narrate Unholy Womb, the collection. And 
I was really hesitant on that because there had been one where there was like a 15 minute audition and I was just like, wow. And you know, because there are errors and mistakes and go overs and then you have to edit it and all that. So it's not just 15 minutes of sitting down. It's a lot longer than that. But, but this was the first one I'd ever read where they wanted a whole story. And, uh, you know, I can't say that it was too much uh, for him to ask because, you know, he kindly let us run this story for free on our show. But it was too much to ask for somebody to audition to do a whole story. So I sat down and I read the story from beginning to end. And I thought, you know, I like this story. And I came up with how I was going to do the voodoo Charlie voice, which to me was way harder than all the other voices. Well, it's because you pulled out standard voices that you've done many times before for most of them. Yeah, there's a there's a wheelhouse that I've got, and mm-hmm. but Voodoo Charlie's voice was not in my wheelhouse, and uh, it uh, once I figured out how I was going to do that, then yeah, I sat down and I recorded the whole thing, and then went through and edited the whole thing, and I sent it to him, and luckily, he said yes, you've got the gig, and I, I assumed that I would have the gig when I first sent the thing in, (laughs) because if I was competing with six other people that were hungry enough to do an entire short story for their audition, yikes. And I I think I even mentioned it to you when I first got it, it would be like, you're auditioning to be a porn actress. And it's like, okay, do this guy on film. That's your audition. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe I'll have to cut that out. What do you think? (laughs) Don't go there. Anyway, I sent it to him and he liked it and he hired me to do the whole thing. And uh, it's, Five stories. They're all about this length, about 20-something minutes. There's one that's longer that's probably 45 minutes, almost an hour. And that one would make a really good movie, too. The fact that it's longer is one of those where you could just adapt it from beginning to end. Uh It's a story about uh, there's a reporter for the local newspaper in this little town, and he keeps getting these calls about something strange happening on Halloween. And, of course, because it's Halloween, he thinks... That it's pranks or that it's, you know, kid related. But he calls the sheriff just to ask, you know, have you heard any of this stuff too? And, and the sheriff has had these experiences also. And he's like, no, this isn't pranks. This, there's something going on. And so the reporter and the sheriff get together to investigate. They go out to one of the scenes of disturbance. And they, yeah, it turns out that there's something in their town that has come this day. And, and it's, it's just a, like a, leaving a, a swath of destruction in the town and it's just like going in a particular direction it has a mission and there's no way of stopping it I, oh dude I just I, I loved that story it was called Hungry is the Night was that mm. story and you and I we talk about titles a lot yeah because we both struggle sometimes I mean you seem to struggle more than I do but I do I struggle a lot yeah if I don't have a title usually from the beginning you know if I get when I start a story and I start writing on it, sometimes I'll get a good title for it and I'll know, okay, this story's called this. Other times I just never, ever. My title for my uh, triple word score contest story is just awful. I never got a title for it. I just couldn't come up with one. And so I just, I crapped one out and said, okay, I guess this is the title. But um, just couldn't get one for it. I had a joke title for it, but it wasn't I liked a, that joke title, but having not read the story, yeah, it wasn't I didn't know a joke if it story, fit. so yeah. it didn't work at all. But uh, but yeah, this this guy like unholy womb, it's kind of an artsy fartsy title, but it fits. You hear the story and you're like unholy womb. Okay, I know what they're talking about, and it fits the story, and it's it creates an image in your mind, even though it's not going to be of a pumpkin with a demon inside it, but it. Anyhow, this guy wrote five stories, and it was a pleasure narrating them. So I told you, let's do one of these stories in full cast with music and sound effects on the Dune Steve, because the guy said we could. You said no, and give me your 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 reasoning why. I mean, I I agree with you ultimately. Well, uh, I just figured it would be best. I mean. Basically, what we're kind of doing for this guy, uh, I mean, he gives us his story to run for free on our show, and we're kind of giving him a free commercial to all our listeners. Hey, we liked this guy's story. I mean, you liked this guy's story enough that you wanted to put one on the show, so I figured the best 
kind of thing that we could do for him is to give people an actual example of what they would get if they were to go over and get the the whole collection and listen to the rest of the stories. They would get what they heard here, only more. Instead of giving people an idea that they're going to get something different, which they wouldn't get, you know, if we did a whole full cast version and then they went over and they were like, oh, well, that's not like what I heard on the other one. That's, I don't know cool. if that would set people up to be disappointed or maybe some people would be like, hey, I'm so much better than what those freaking Dune Steve guys usually do. I'm sick of their crap. I don't know, but whatever. I, somehow I <laughs> doubt it because, see, I did all the voices, including the female voices. And unless it's like Woman Called Witch, neither of us tend to do the female voices on True. the show. Just because it's, I think it's got to take people out of the story more. Maybe not. Maybe I'm underestimating the listeners. But it just seems like if you hear an actual female delivering the lines, you don't have to say this was a woman. They just know it was a woman. Yeah, I just figured it would be best if we gave them an actual sample of what they were getting. So that's my main... And it was easier. Certainly it was. <laughs> You'd already Especially done it. Especially for you. <laughs> <laughs> so we didn't have to redo it. So there's that too. You've got to work twice as hard on the next episode. To okay. Make up for it. Okay. Uh, one other thing, he has a short story anthology or collection or whatever you call it on Amazon that has like 40 stories in it. Wow, really? And I looked and it has these stories that are in Unholy Womb on it. And I had talked to him earlier about the collection because I, I enjoyed it. Oh, geez. I've complained to you a lot about some of the stuff that I've had to read on there. And, you know, it's not entirely their fault. Sometimes I bit off more than I could chew Mm -hmm. with like a novel saying that I would have the novel done. And then I realized what it takes to narrate an entire novel and all that. But this one was just so much easier and well-written and fun. All the stories were fun to read. And so I emailed him and I was like, wow, you have more stuff. And yeah, he has tons of stories. And what he did was he just, he realized these five all take place on Halloween And so he's like, wow, that's great. This can be a collection. And that's exactly what Abby told us when she was here in this room, you know, eight months ago, was find three or four of your stories that have something in common, a common theme, and say that's your collection and put them out there. And here we are, eight months later, nine months later, and I still haven't done it. Uh I mean, I tried. I got this. Well, you can't see how far my fingers are they're not I'm really holding that up. close to it. it's i got he's actually stretching them wider than uh, his hands normally go <laughs> it's just a, a cool idea very attractive idea to me to find three or four of my stories and say these could go together as a little collection these could go together as a little collection and uh, i'm sure steven out there will uh, do this again with some of those other stories that are in his collection and you know maybe i'll narrate that too i i don't know I mean, it's up to him, I suppose. And then I guess it's up to me to say, yes, I will do that. But I'm saying right now, yes, I will do that. Because I, I, <laughs> like I said, it was a pleasure compared to some of the other projects I've taken on. And these stories seem to be right down your alley. You have chosen some stories that are not even in on, on your block, much less down your alley. I'm sure that has something to do with it as well. I mean, a story set on Halloween, the little thing that described the book probably just had to have that in the intro. And you'd be like, oh... I'll do that one for free. Of course, you do all of them for free. but <laughs> Well, yeah, I definitely did this one for free because you're listening to it for free. But if you enjoyed it, by all means, go out there and buy it because suddenly it's not for free if somebody buys it. Yay. I don't know. We, we Everybody has things that appeal to them. But we've done hours and hours and hours talking about Halloween and how much we love it. And something tells me we'll do it again <laughs> this year, too, because it, it was such a positive experience last year to do the 13 days of Halloween, nights of Halloween. And uh, I, I'm sure we could come up with other stuff. In fact, we could ask people what they want us to talk about for the 13 nights of Halloween in 2013. But one last thing, this is a special episode because this is the last time we're going to be recording in this room we've got another episode we've already recorded that will come out after this but th- it occurred to me this is the last time i'm ever going to be at this house actually uh come over on friday night you can help us move everything out how's that sound <laughs> oh, 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 come down. <laughs> but yeah it's uh it's kind of the end of an era i've lived in this house for 
nigh on nine years. What, was this house built and then you moved in or had somebody else lived here? It was built. It was one of those kind of things where the builder builds it like on spec just because they got the lot and they need to start building something so that their guys don't just sit around wanting money and not getting work and they have nothing to sell and etc. First time I ever came here, I want to say was December of 2004. Is that possible? It's possible. We were here then. You and I had reconnected through email and stuff. I mean, we never really... Disconnected? Well, physically we disconnected because you were two states away, three states away. Even when you were in California, you were 12 hours away. Yeah, might as well have been states away. That's what California is. Sadly. And if by some miracle, we didn't grow apart or we didn't our, our friendship didn't atrophy and die uh -huh. like it did with everybody else i went to college with yeah and you had moved in here i thought you had just moved in here but maybe i'm wrong and i was visiting for well the if, holidays if you came in december 2004 we'd only been here f less than you know basically four months okay and do you remember the it was the night of that terrible snowstorm <laughs> george Oh, that's right. That's uh, that's when the aliens were in town. I drove here, and I'd never been to your town. And I think it was already night when I got here. I don't know. Yeah, but the snow so. was coming down. It was the really huge snowflakes and the wind and all that stuff. And there was a question as to whether I would be able to make it back home. And I always thought that there was a story in that, in the yeah. snowstorm coming and me being forced to stay here. And, uh, We've meant to ride it more than once, I think. We've... Uh... Just not done it yet, but we shall. But that was the first time I was here, and today is the last time I'll be here. It's just, it's, it's kind of sad. Are you, how much are you going to miss this place? It's hard to say now. I don't know, you know. It's been a lot of work over the last little while, you know, getting it ready, getting it ready to sell. Now, you know, packing everything up and getting ready to move out and et cetera. And it, I'm to the point where I just want to be free of it, you know what I mean? But I'm sure when the actual time comes, uh, there will be a lot of nostalgia and a lot of uh, those kind of feelings. Like my youngest daughter, this is basically the only house she's ever lived in. I mean, she was actually born in California, but she was four months old when we moved out here. Six months old when we moved into this house. So she's never really known anywhere else. And uh, it's kind of the same for my other kids. They may have known other places, but they don't really... You know, I mean, even my oldest was four when oh. we moved here. So, you know, he doesn't really remember any of it. He's seen videos or something, but he doesn't really remember what it was like. Are you excited about the new house? I am excited. It'll be really nice. Did you see that picture that I put on Facebook? Where I, <laughs> I did. We're going to have our own, I mean, not our own, but more so than this, room to record in. Yeah, it'll be a study that uh, will be a study will be the you know the room where things will be and i'm thinking about trying to set up the mics permanently there hopefully i don't know we'll have to see we will still have a young child that roams around and trashes things because that's just kind of what he does i'm not sure if i'm willing to leave the mics out to be trashed but uh they are nice mics we were recording something the other day i was editing and you were talking about the Scott Pig mics versus the previous mics. Mm -hmm. You're like, someday when we have a lot of money, you too can have Scott Pig mics. <laughs> That's right. Someday. But uh, that is definitely not today. I would say that we have done every episode of the Dune Steef in this house. Are there any episodes we didn't do in this house? Well, we recorded uh, a story and, an, and a post episode at new media expo we still haven't released that story but that would be the one episode i guess that was recorded not here i don't think there's anything else we walked around the block with <laughs> yeah but those weren't dude steve's that's those were, true that those are gets that my gets ghost. my goat so so this is the end of an era and, and and it's not because the next episode will also have been recorded in this house but this is the commemorative last episode thing it's kind of like graduation my nephew just this week had his preschool graduation <laughs> and i kid you not they played fudge and pomp and circumstance when the five-year-olds walked out or four-year-olds uh -huh. dude preschool and they played pomp and circumstance <laughs> did they put actual hats on them well they were pa made of paper uh-huh but were they like really see when my son graduated from his preschool thing 
they had basically like Burger King kind of crown looking pieces of paper that they stuck onto their heads that looked sort of like the graduation hat. I believe they call it a mortar board. Isn't that what it's called? <laughs> okay. I can't remember. But anyways, they had, you know, it, it wasn't very realistic looking. And they had, they had you get a dress shirt and put it on them backwards. So it looked kind of like a, a robe. Oh, you're kidding. I, I, I grown up dress shirt. Right. Yeah. Like I had to put my son in my dress shirt. And he walked in and it was backwards, so it looked like a big white robe. That's clever. Um, yeah, I don't remember if they played Pomp and Circumstance, though. It's been too long. I guess I'll get that all again coming up here soon. We, but yeah, it's, We've it's talked funny. about how bullshitty that is. <laughs> uh, because my niece also had her graduation going from sixth grade to seventh grade. I don't understand. You graduated to the next class. It's like all kids do that unless they get held back. <laughs> but you guys have elementary a ceremony? school, right? Or, or is her class a six, seven, eight middle school or something? One of those weird ones. Uh, she went to the same school I went to. And when I was there, it was kindergarten through seventh. Now it's kindergarten through sixth. So I guess technically she is moving to a new school. From one school to the other. But at least there I can say, you know, okay, you graduated from that school. So at least it's something. Whereas the worst is like, oh, it's third grade graduation. You're now going to fourth grade, which is across the hall. You know, that's that's dumb. And if her school was one of those where it was like K through eight or nine or whatever, and they did one at six, it's like, no, it doesn't count. Unless you're at least going to a different school, you didn't graduate. Well, it's something that you and I have talked about a lot because and we really responded to that moment in Incredibles where they were having this big hullabaloo for him to go from fifth grade to sixth grade. Oh. And he was talking about, you know, nobody celebrates actual achievement anymore. Uh -huh. They celebrate mediocrity. Why do they do that? Why do they do that? Wow, you have graduated from second grade. I don't know. Maybe they're trying to make kids like school because so few of them do. I don't know. It's one of those kind of things where you got to keep patting them on the back and saying good job so they'll keep at it. I'm not really sure. But yeah, it is uh, It is much more common to celebrate mediocrity and to punish greatness. <laughs> well, it's I mean, like, reality TV has celebrated the hell out of mediocrity. But how? in what way have we punished greatness? Well, I mean, it's the same kind of thing. Like my, my kids played baseball uh, last year and they had a rule. What did they call it? No um, child left behind. It was kind of like that. Yeah. Dang, I can't remember the name of it. But basically, they didn't want one team to massacre the other team. Because oh. then the other team would feel bad. So if a team scored six runs in one inning, then the, the inning was, was over. Not the game, but just the inning. It was like, okay, that's all you get to score in one inning. You guys are done. Now you're out in the field and the other team gets to bat. I, got, oh, it's the, I think they called it the mercy rule or something like that. But yeah, basically, you know, they didn't want... You to just clobber the other team too badly because then they'd feel bad and they wouldn't want to play baseball again or Can I whatever it is. Can I just choose to believe that they don't want the games to go on and on and on and that's why they made that rule? <laughs> there could be that too. That's the parents' side of you. Parents, I mean, I'm like, oh, is there a way we can call this? Because seriously, it's getting ugly and it's never going to end. And uh, Dancing with the Star starts in like 20 minutes. So seriously, can we wrap this up? You and all the other moms <laughs> say that. <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting. We we've we've told people enough times about how we're recording in my kitchen at the at the kitchen table, and uh, pretty soon we won't be we won't be at a kitchen table at all for a couple months. We won't. I don't know what we're gonna do to tell you the truth. We may be at a kitchen table, but it won't be mine. It's we're gonna be living in a apartment that we're uh, renting from somebody else. But it will be. Your apartment. It's not like we're, you're staying with your sister. No, no, it's not like that. It is our apartment for the time being. But while the house is being finished, the new house will eventually be in the study. Wow, that's And we'll exciting. have like smoking jackets on and slippers. And we'll have like a dog laying at our feet. At each one of us, we'll have our own dog to lay at our feet. Wow, and, I can't wait, man. <laughs> and a nice shag rug down there. And oh, it's going to be sumptuous. <laughs> uh, instead of a shag rug, could it be a bear skin? Ooh, rug? maybe. Yeah, we could do that. We could go there. 
There's a sportsman uh, store nearby that we could probably get ourselves a bearskin rug from. I, I'll bet you could buy a car for what you could buy a bearskin <laughs> rug for. That's probably true. But yeah, it'll be interesting to be in a study. It's one of those things that I, I, I remember. See, when we first moved here, I still had plans to have a study. And I think I even had a study. We may have even recorded in it for a little yeah, while. I think it was... the sec- second episode we recorded at this table. But for about a year, I thought we were in that little room there, which is yeah. the baby's room now. Yeah. The study, and then before it even really became the study, because it never even really got furnished. I mean, it had like one bookshelf, which we'd had for a long time, and then like a folding table that we had the computer on. <laughs> And uh, before I, I, it ever even became a study, it was taken away and it became my older son's room. And then later when the baby came along, we finished the room downstairs and my son went downstairs and the baby went in there. And uh, But yeah, I think all the way back where we did that one episode where we were reading feedback. <laughs> Do you remember that we had so the, you fighting? the feedback episode and we were like <laughs> reading our little script and yelling at each other? My my wife woke up and she's like, what's going on? Are you guys fighting with each other in there? <laughs> and that was because we were in the room right next door to her. It's kind of actually better that we're all the way out here in the kitchen because at least it puts a little distance between us and the sleepers. <laughs> We do a lot of shouting on the show. We, do, we read stories and yeah, that's, lots of times they include That's shouting. where the shouting really comes from for the most part. That and an announcer man. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Anyways. Well, I guess we'll finish up. So this will be the last episode here at this house. And uh, <sighs> Okay, well, hey, I'd like to thank Stephen Waddell for uh, saying we could do this and you for saying hey here's an easy episode you can let us know if it was jarring but and you can let us know if you're gonna miss the house i i I don't know yeah (laughs) you don't have to comment it's it's all right just go buy that book yeah i wonder how weird it was to people to hear a solo read something that we've never done before we've come close but we've even from the very 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 first episode we were already like no we're gonna have somebody different doing all the voices or at least doing you know us doing different kinds of voices so you can tell the difference beginning we even had a little bit of sound effects and we didn't go over the top like we eventually got to the point of but we gunshots were there sound effects installed there had to have been something something. i don't remember what though i remember there was a a cleaning lady (laughs) yeah and you used an actual cleaning lady for that i think that brings us to the end of the show yeah, thanks to everyone for listening to all the episodes at this house. There's actually st- probably still some to come that we recorded and are being released out of order. Like a band who names their <laughs> third album a self-titled name. No, don't get on that. <laughs> Although I think like the Beatles released like Let It Be and then they put out another album and then Let It Be came out or something like that. And so they came out out of order of release order. And there was some kind of like that. So basically we're the Beatles. Yes. <laughs> as far as podcasting in this house, we are the Beatles. Yes, we are. Thanks for listening, folks. I'm Big Anklovich. And I'm Rich Outfield. And we'll see you later. Happy Halloween. <laughs> Happy Halloween. <laughs> Thanks for listening to The Dune Steve. The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. Believe me, we know that from experience. Take two. But on top of that, Zippity Doo Dah is still like that's you know it's a song that they always go back to i mean friggin hannah montana did a version of zippity doodah no way and it's so vastly superior to the original (laughs) you sir are worse than hitler (laughs) it would have to be (laughs) sorry i guess i couldn't sell it um and (laughs) there is nothing we won't try never heard the word impossible this time there's no stopping us cut it out